Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic today is gender and thinking through gender in relationship to uh, the Bible. And you can tell that our configuration is a little different than normal. And in fact, you ought to be all messed up because Sandy's in the seat that I normally sit in. And Kim is in the seat that she's she's in over there because we're going to try and do this on a co-hosted structure in which Kim is going to help us with uh, with the topic and we're going to have a try and have a three-way conversation here uh, about about gender. So Kim, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and then we'll be off and running. Fantastic. Well, my name is Kimberly Cook and I'm the senior administrator at the Hendricks Center and I am also a PhD student here at DTS in the area of theology. So I'm thrilled to be here. Excuse me, I'm thrilled to be here. And um, let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, Sandy, how did you get started in this whole area of gender studies? Gender studies. Well, it began with a crisis of womanhood because I'm the fourth of five kids in a big family, wanted a big family. That was really the only vision I had for myself. I, it was really the only vision I thought was ideal womanhood. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so when I hit the brick wall of infertility and pregnancy loss, for me it was not just an ethical, marital, emotional, financial crisis. It was also a crisis of identity. Um, and I had to go back to Genesis and re-look through, all the way through the Bible, what is a woman? What is a man? What is Christian subculture's influence on that? And what mm-hmm. is really transcultural? Because I had picked up a lot of Christian subculture, uh, even more so probably than the re- cultural around us was the Christian culture that wasn't always uh, really deeply rooted in the Bible, but was maybe American. Mm-hmm. So that was part of it. The other thing was that Dallas Seminary, Dallas Seminary recognized that they didn't have anybody who'd actually study this on an academic level. Okay. So the, the man who was the academic dean at the time said, as part of your PhD study, <laughs> if you would uh, really focus on the history of gender, history of ideas about gender, um, the particularly the feminism, American movements on that, so that you've actually read the primary documents and um, maybe we're telling an evangelical story of that that isn't completely academically informed. So mm. to the seminary's credit, they Absolutely. encouraged me to, to do that. So that's sort of how I ended up here. And you've been dealing with that ever since. You teach the course <laughs> on gender studies yeah. here. And tell us a little bit about how that's structured. So the way it's structured, I love partnering with men. I think it's part coming right out of Genesis that we need each other. We don't always have to say exactly who brings what. Male brings this, female. We just know we need each other. And so I'll bring in different men and women who have wrestled through various issues. For example, Barry Jones uh, at a local church, their church has worked through where they stand on women and what that means in terms of preaching and all that. And so he comes in and shares how they walk their church through that and what mistakes they made and you know what regrets they have and what really worked. Because a lot of our students are going to go out to places that are going to be dealing with some of these issues. So we're not just exploring what the Bible says, although that's part of it. We're also exploring the implementation and the ramifications. Because in different cultures are in different places on the question, and then how to Absolutely. negotiate that space is exactly. as important as the content that exactly. you do with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, let that that kind of sets the table for us in terms of, of why we've asked you here. Which uh, I, I'm thrilled um, that you're uh, willing to do this. Let, let's start at the beginning, and uh, just as an interesting example of learning on the way, um, I had suggested that we start in in Genesis one with the idea of the helper, and you very helpfully <laughs> suggested, "Well, wait a minute. Let's take one more step back. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at what it means." Means to be made in the image of God, which I think is a good starting place. So let's start there. So, so someone walks in the room and says, "Oh, image of God." That's transparent. We know exactly what that means. And um, and you go. So uh, I'll begin with a story. On the first day of class in this gender class, um, I was driving in thinking, "Should I even cover women are made in the image of God?" Duh. But I thought, well, I'm not sure everybody believes that or knows that, and so. I started with Genesis 1, you know, male and female, he made them, uh, I will make them in my image. And a student on the front row, she raised her hand, she goes, are you saying 
I already image God? I said, I'm not saying it. Genesis is saying that. She said, she turned around to everybody, did you all know that? And they're looking at her like, yeah. And she burst into tears. I don't have to be married to image God. I don't have to have kids to image God. She's still writing about it 10 years later. She just has never Mm -hmm. gotten over the thrill of that. Her church had been so careful to warn her about the dangers of radical feminism, they hadn't told her who she was. Hmm. And so that's why I wanted to be in there, Mm -hmm. because um, not everybody does know that. And and that's that's an essential part of starting with what is a woman is she's a human being made in the image of God. And the program of the way uh, of the way Genesis one unfolds is this um, step by step walk through the various aspects of what God has created from the beginning, and we end interestingly enough not with the man by himself we actually right. end with the woman completing the creation of what it means to be human it's very good and uh, I other. think that's mm-hmm. significant yeah. yeah so what do you feel like that tells us about God in that if in women are also in the image of God what does that yeah. contribute to what we understand about God that maybe we miss sometimes if we only consider yeah. the male Great as question. Of God. Well, I think for all the things we can debate about the meaning of Imago Dei or mm. image of God, we can also step back and go, we're, we're both made in the image of God. The commands that w- of what we're supposed to do in terms of dominion and multiplication, in both cases, they need each other. Sometimes that gets divided, like men do dominion and women do babies, and you're like, guys, it takes two <laughs> you know, yeah. to do each of those. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and so just even the idea that a woman is made to rule the earth. Mm-hmm. Again, we don't rule is a scary word, right? We immediately, you know, start qualifying that and we need to maybe not just let it be what it is. Like not not rule the earth by herself, but men and women need each other. And we don't even have to say, again, we don't even have to say she brings this and he brings this, which usually results in stereotype, right? And can result in conflict. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You just say we need each other. Yeah. So, in in we relook at our missions committee differently. Do we have men and women on the committee? There's an interesting piece of research uh, that came out after the whole Bernie Madoff Wall Street scandal, where people said, "Okay, those were all male boards, and look how corrupt they were. What would happen if you had all female boards?" No surprise, they studied them and found they were just as corrupt. <laughs> what what they also found though was when you had boards that had both men and women on them. They made more more ethical decisions, hmm. and it just seems to go right back to Genesis, right? That we, in some That's mysterious way that we can't always quantify, we need each other. Mm-hmm. So, uh, the, uh, and the, and the point of imaging God, of course, is the fact that we're designed to reflect and reflect back to God the way in which He made us. We're yes. designed for relationship yeah. not only with Him. We're designed with relationship for each other. Uh, that relationship is complex. It's been complex from the beginning. God is a Trinity. Right. That's a right, right, right. that's a yeah. complex relational right. uh, model to start yeah. off with. It's the base. And so, uh, and, and by complex here, I don't I don't mean. Uh, I, I don't mean to, to say, well, it's so difficult. Where you know we, we can't do it. It's it's simply to say that it's that it's it's not easy to package into a formula. It's more right. dynamic than that. Right. And any time you start with the Trinity, I think we can we can all agree that there's something relational about humanity that's reflected in the commit uh, in the Trinity. But to assume that we can find out something human. By looking at how the Father, Son, and Spirit relate, um, it might be better to say when we're humans, we're reflecting the church. Mm-hmm. And it, like even marriage is Christ and the church. It's not the Father and the Son, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's still like a sort of a separation of, of God and human rather than seeing something human mm-hmm. happening in the Godhead. Mm-hmm. And yet the, at sense. the same time, on the flip side, there are – relational dimensions about how they ideally relate to each other that has a lot to teach us about Certainly. the nature of the cooperation. Certainly. For example, sure. uh, sometimes in some passages, it's very hard to tell if and which person of yes. the Trinity is actually at work. 
Yes. You the know, vision of labor has a lot of overlap there. Exactly right. right. Yeah. And, yeah. and so even though there are distinctions, even mm-hmm. though our confession have distinctions, we've got Father, sure. Son, and Spirit and that right. kind of thing, which we recognize and affirm, the yeah. nature of the unity with which they work is so interwoven that you don't get the sense of conflict that you sometimes get when you get roles placed in other yeah. kinds of contexts and circumstances. Absolutely. I mean, that's part of how we know the Son is God, right? Because mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> He's doing things that, that the Father does, like create the world, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, yeah. so um, anything else on image of God? Um, nothing, nothing else comes to mind on image of God. Um, helpers, helpers a good next place to okay. go, I think. <laughs> okay. I think. Uh, let me go ahead. You know, go, okay, I'm going to ask him a question. Okay, <laughs> when you hear helper, what do you hear? Well, that's what actually I was thinking of formulating a question <laughs> about that yeah. because that is just you know in in our current climate and um, the way I think that a lot of women are raised and women my age were raised. I hear that word, and there is a part of me that. There's a little bit of a reaction to, and I think, well, am I, am I just a helper? Right, because you hear we, hamburger helper or plumber's helper <laughs> or some sort of inferior. Absolutely, kind of helper. and right. and is there and that nothing is not, that I was created yeah. to do on my own? Am I just, mm-hmm. right. you know, a sidekick? Yeah. What well, would you I think, say to that? Great, great questions. I think part of part of what helps us is. In some contexts, we've been taught that's what a helper is, mm-hmm. right? The Absolutely. world revolves around him, and then you're just sort of the silent witness that makes his world happen, which isn't really right. Oh, man, um, that can be so cool. Uh, no, I just yeah. no, I know. <laughs> you say that, but I know you better than that. You have a strong partner, and you love it. <laughs> that's right. Um, so the word helper, um, if you think about when we pray for God to help us, we don't think of him as a junior assistant who has no power, right? Like God is a strong help, mm-hmm. and the, sometimes, like the word that the Septuagint translators use was a word that was used of a surgeon in a tough case who calls in a skilled colleague that's skilled in an area, you know, that needs expertise that is lacking. And you know, six time, sixteen times in the Old Testament, that word azer helper is used of God, and so, and it's usually used in a military com. Uh, context, which is interesting when you look at like Proverbs 31, because you have all this military language used of the idealized woman. She's a woman of valor. She's got strong arms. She's she's going after prey to feed her family. Like this, you know, we talked about this on mm-hmm. an earlier podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think some of some of our gut reaction comes from wrong teaching, and and that needs to be corrected. And what are we talking about when we talk about helper? It's not on an org chart. It's not like this. It's it's a partner. Yeah, and I, 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 we're, we will the, the, really the whole rest of the podcast is designed to kind of flesh that out because I mm-hmm. think that's a uh, an important um, perception and may in some cases a misperception that needs to be uh, that yeah. needs to be worked through. I, I do think that people are slow to realize how important that word helper is as a description of the character of God. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Uh, and, and so they automatically put it in a rank category right. when it actually is a description of a character category, if I can mm-hmm. say it that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that makes that can make a significant difference in how we ought to think about it. So, so my follow-up question is, um, so how should we think of the category of helper? How, what, if it's if it's not this impression of uh, of mm-hmm. the silent sidekick or whatever, right. Um, uh, right. then then what is it? I think I think maybe it would help to begin with what it isn't. Okay. Some of what mm-hmm. it isn't. For example, when Peter talks in First Peter three about a wife in in a unhappy marriage. Um, and he, he talks about the way to win your husband is not by preaching at him every day. It's, it's to your silent witness. And he, and he describes um, the gentle, quiet spirit that's so precious to God, which in many women's contexts has been taught as the gentle, quiet personality. Mm-hmm. Okay? Big difference, right? Mm-hmm. As you said, it's character. Mm-hmm. A character of someone who's at peace and not striving can still be an extrovert, can still be fun-loving, can still... Um, be strong. Be strong. Absolutely, be strong. And so, so, again, sometimes that's been taught in women's studies, in feminism studies, um, 
and anti, I should say anti-feminism studies, mm-hmm. as as the ideal Christian woman mm-hmm. is silent and introverted, and like, and so that gets added to almost help withdrawn. Her. Exactly. Yeah. Like the more you are that, the more ideal woman you right, are. Right. Right. And so that gets added to help her as sort of a junior citizen mm-hmm. of things when that's not at all. I mean, the context of that is. How to how to win over somebody who's not listening, and and if you put that next to the creation of the woman and what it is that was needed, you know, God said in making the woman, it's not good for the man to be alone, and the idea is is to bring someone alongside of him who is a a complement in the best right. sense of that term, and to complement exactly. so that together they can execute what it is that right. God has asked to take place in the creation. Exactly. Yeah. They need each other. Yeah. So when I hear that and I think of it in practical, okay, so what does this look like? I'm I'm a pastor's wife, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And, yeah. um, I'm also an event planner. Yeah. And so when I hear that... And you co-teach with your husband. That's true. I do. Yeah. There's, okay. there's lots of other okay. things you that need I need to disclose but I, yeah, everything. That's fair. Okay. That's fair. <laughs> but I... I hear that, and I feel like how that is often played out in Christian communities is then the work is being done, absolutely, and it's definitely a partnership. The men would never claim that the women are not a part of carrying out that work, but Mm -hmm. the women tend to be the ones in the back rooms and Mm -hmm. in the background making everything happen and, and lifting I guess, lifting the man up and putting him on display and allowing him to give the message or, you know, mm-hmm. do do whatever that particular ministry or outreach is. And so how do we think through what you guys are talking about? And is that correct? Yeah. Is that the way it's supposed no, to be? No, it's not the way it's supposed to be. Well, then, it's hard on men, too. Like, okay. So I'm married to an introvert with the gift of administration. And he would rather be like the church treasurer where I have speaking gifts. Mm -hmm. So for the first few years of our marriage, he's feeling the social pressure that he should be up front, and I'm feeling the social pressure that I should be in back, but we're both thinking, but the church could benefit if we would operate out of our giftedness, right? Mm -hmm. So fortunately, he's the most secure man I've ever met. So (laughs) he just decided he didn't care that he was going to do whatever needed to happen for me to thrive. And I and so I was going to do what what would happen for him to thrive. So it was the exact opposite of what you're describing, mm-hmm. right? But but the gifts aren't distributed by gender, right? Absolutely. Like everybody gets all of them, mm-hmm. and so it's it's it wasn't just hard on me, right? It was hard on my husband. I had another student who told me that he walked in as a visitor to the church. He's an introvert. He has sort of a sign behind the scenes gifts. He said, "I sat down in a Sunday school class. They divide us into small groups, and I ended up in a small group with three other women, and they handed me the curriculum and said, teach us." He's like, I'm a visitor. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to figure out, how, you know, do I even belong? Is this a good ethos for me? And it was just assumed that because I'm a man, I'm the leader in this group, even though I wasn't even allowed to just be a visitor and an observer. Um, and, and he said it was incredibly awkward and difficult and frustrating. We get other guys in, in, uh, that come through here that um, – the artist types, especially in our mm-hmm. media arts department, where um, dad wanted a football player. Dad wanted, you know, an upfront kind of kid, and he was more the reflective, sensitive soul, and so all of those cultural Christian, Christian culture, and the broader culture of views of what manhood should look like can be heartbreaking if that's really not the gift package. That yeah, you have. I very actually have a very similar story in reverse. Okay. And that is, um, as you know, Sally can be expressive. <laughs> uh, May her my, tribe increase. Size no. my wife. Yeah, <laughs> she's fantastic. So, she, uh, she's so, so what she thinks, I know. Yeah. And um, and we had a relationship in which that was very transparent. Mm-hmm. I was comfortable with it. She was comfortable with it. Some of the elders was... in our church were not comfortable with it. Yeah. And basically, they. 
would talk to me about, oh, you give your wife way too much space, to which my initial reaction is, in one level, that's none of your business. Right. Uh, it's your marriage. Yeah, right? exactly. But but secondly, I would say the second point is, is God has brought us together with a certain combination in which we part of part of being married is figuring out what that combination is right. and how that can best work. Right. And and in my in my role as head, in the way they're thinking about it, part of what is called upon for me to do and to be is to be sensitive to who she is right. and how God has made her and how God has made us as a couple together. And thus to to right. to you know, kind of map out the path that works for this unit that God has created our marriage to be. That unit may not be like the unit of the exactly. couple sitting next to me and that's of the elder fine, that I mean with. Right? And that's yeah. absolutely fine. Okay. Right. That's absolutely fine. But we right. get ourselves into trouble, I think, right. when we try and cookie cutter and make right. everybody the same when you've got a different combination and a different combination of gifts exactly. that are being meshed together to make this family and this marriage what it is. Is that concept transferable to the church, do you think? So would it be possible to consider different church communities as, you know, functioning couples, for lack of a better way of saying it, but as different communities that can work to complement one another in different ways, and so it might look different? I, I think the answer to that question is yes. I think, it, I think the, there's another question behind that, and it all depends on how that's done. You know what is said and how that how that is explained and and how it's viewed. But I think in principle, yes, that that you've got different communities that have uh, that that might manifest how that works in different ways. Um, and as long as it's within the range of what Scripture is calling for, you can get variation. You know, it's it's not unlike the way God has made people. You know, right. He's made. People and nations, and they have a yeah. terrific variety between them. Right. Uh, but at the same time, and, and they have their own identity and their own culture to a certain extent, and they enrich each other in the midst of some of that difference while recognizing that there are certain things that actually cause them to be connected to each other at the same time. So I do think, in principle, uh, that can work out uh, work out in, in that kind of direction. And I think it's a, it's a challenge for people because I think we we like the simplicity of trying to make everything very much the same, rather than yeah. the, the the relational mm -hmm. complexity of actually <laughs> negotiating out. Uh, right. differing kinds of spaces for one another. So just hopping back into the conversation, before the break, Dr. Bach, you said that we would be talking a little bit about marriage mm -hmm. in this part of the podcast. And before we hop in there, maybe it would quickly be helpful to address what we do with singles yeah. and how we consider gender and the relation between the genders as it relates to people who are not married before right. we get into that conversation. So I also co-teach a course with Dr. Gary Barnes in the counseling department on sexual ethics. And one of the assignments that we give our students is to Google churches that are writing manhood and womanhood curriculum or teaching that kind of curriculum and just having them assess it based on how we've walked them through some of these issues. And they find almost without exception that churches creating these, these curricula have gone to the marriage verses to describe what's manly and womanly. Mm -hmm. And consequently, it sends the message that you're not a complete man if you're not married. You're not a complete woman. Instead of going back to like the image of God um, and, and looking at even at uh, designs like uh, Jesus and John the Baptist and Paul and, and sort of the new creation um, multiply worshipers uh, on the earth, they're looking at you have to get married or at least it sends that subtle message. Yeah, which which kind of which, is interesting because in First Corinthians seven, when Paul has that exactly. opportunity, <laughs> yeah, like, that's not where he lands. It's not where he lands. So yeah. that's not the ultimate manhood. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, and he's not married. Mm -hmm. So um, our churches keep need to work. I know there's there's been a lot of work done recently, but we need to keep working on not sending that message that marriage is the ideal state. We churches are to be, you know. 
kudos to them for lifting up family in a culture that doesn't always do that. But it can also go the other extreme and, and make it look like that's the ideal of manhood and womanhood, and it's it's not. So when we think about singleness, and I think about that passage in 1 mm-hmm. Corinthians 7 in particular, I think about how one of the rationales for Paul saying that, you know, given the choice to be single versus being married, he would advise on the single side of that scale, is the ability to be um, focused completely on serving the Lord faithfully. And so that's telling you that that the definition of who the person is is defined by how they're relating to God primarily and what God asks of them as opposed to anything else that, that surrounds them. So instead of trying to figure out what does a man act like? Mm-hmm. What does a woman act like? Does she wear pink? Right? Mm-hmm. We should be that that's almost a, it is a misdirection of our focus. We should be <laughs> saying who should I be? Um love, joy, peace, patience, like the fruit of the spirit. I should be pursuing Christ and then embodied as a female, I'm going to be feminine. Mm-hmm. Embodied as a male, I'm going to be masculine. But that doesn't mean I'm going to always fit the cultural norms. For example, one of the one of the things that I discovered in my history of ideas on gender was really interesting to look at the first century and what was considered manly then. Mm-hmm. And it was not considered manly for anyone to do any sort of violence to your body or to look on your body. So and so that's sort of the right as a citizen that you you know you don't touch me. So it's a shame to be a gladiator. It's a shame to be an actor because those are occupations where people are looking on you and violence is done to you. So then to see that Jesus voluntarily allows himself to be treated violently, he's sacrificing his man card for humanity. For Paul to allow himself to be whipped and beaten in Philippi before he says, "Oh by the way, <laughs> I'm, I'm a citizen," he has put the gospel priority over ideals of manhood. So he's, he's really sacrificing the cultural ideal of manhood it, because he has a greater good. Some of our students sometimes do that. Like, it, like um, if, if they've been taught that it's, it's a man's job to provide and their wives help put them through seminary, mm-hmm. they're like, yeah, but in, you know, in Luke 8, the women are providing for Jesus. And we have a bigger goal here mm-hmm. than protecting that, that cultural view of manhood. Mm-hmm. And and the and the bigger view is the gospel. And Proverbs thirty one yeah. says a little bit about how the woman is. It says a few things about economics. Yeah, yeah, in it which does. the woman is very very active. Can I can yeah. I ask a question real quick on that? Sure. So, is there anything there? I feel like, particularly in light of a lot of the conversations that have been happening in the culture recently, mm-hmm. there are a lot of young women who are either rethinking. Um, or for the first time kind of thinking through their gender and just because of everything that's happened. Mm -hmm. And would you say that some of the voices that are informing those women as they are trying to think through those things should also be disregarded, um, I'm sorry, I'm not being clear. There's a lot of people who say now what a woman should be, which is very strong and standing up for her rights and standing up in in a strong way. Would you say there's also a place for that to be sacrificed for the gospel at times or not? It's a genuine. Yeah, that is a great question. I think, and that's why we have to walk in the spirit. Like, there's no one cookie can cutter answer, and. There, there's a time to speak and a time to be silent. <laughs> it's right of, out of Ecclesiastes. Mm-hmm. And the only way you know that is if you're working on the Christ-likeness part, mm-hmm. right? So Peter definitely tells the wife in a situation where her husband's not going to hear her to be quiet, right? Because it's not going to help for you to talk all day. But then Paul talks about how will they hear without a preacher, right? Mm-hmm. They're both talking about the gospel, but they're talking about very different contexts. Mm-hmm. I think that's just wisdom as a human, right? So I and I think too sometimes when you're talking about justice, um, um, it it helps to be talking for someone on someone else's behalf rather than your own, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Um, I I can be a lot more forceful when I'm speaking for the voiceless mm-hmm. than I am about you violated my rights. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not I'm not meaning to yeah. silence anybody when no, I ask that question, not. but of when you said not. that, I immediately yeah. thought of. But what about the other side as well? Yeah. When 
we might be willing sure. to sacrifice a little bit of the strength that has been earned. You know? which, which, which raises uh, two sets of questions, and I think it's there, uh, the two topics we have left to cover. Okay. One, we'll talk about marriage, which we said mm-hmm. we were going to cover. But the other thing is kind of the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is the influence of, uh, of the feminist discussion in our culture, okay. which, mm-hmm. uh, which I think has things to, to say to us on the one hand, as well as things to be aware of on the other. And mm-hmm. so, um, so let's, let's mm-hmm. cover those two. Let's, okay. let's shift to marriage. We talked okay. about how what is going on with the gospel is a kind of countercultural yeah. situation. I can't think of a more countercultural passage that has been misused than Ephesians 5. I completely agree. Mm-hmm. So, I completely so, agree. So let's, yeah. let's walk through yeah. that uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, and talk about, you know, the, what makes that passage so famous and a bugaboo for some people is uh, the word uh, submission comes up only. It's mm-hmm. not submission for most people. For some people, it's the word submission. I mean, it's a, it's a <laughs> yeah. bad word. It's, right. a, it, it, it's, a, it's almost a four-letter word. And yet in the context of this passage – and the focus goes there. Right. Yet in the context of this passage, the focus is actually somewhere else. The focus, much more time is spent. Much more time. On the husband's requirement to love, love than on the woman's yes. responsibility yeah. to submit. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about that passage. First, let's talk about how that passage gets misused, and then let's talk about how we should read it. Okay. So, so often when we look at the verbs, the wife gets submit, and it gets taught that the husband gets lead, but that's not his verb. That verb is not there, mm-hmm. right? His verb is love, and it's not phileo love. It's agape love, which looks a whole lot like submission, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I heard you say one time, and I quote you a lot on this, <laughs> that submission is not a woman word. It's a human word. Mm-hmm. We are all called to live in submission to our Creator. Mm-hmm. And, and the beginning of that section is submit yourselves one to another. And then she, she gets, you know, wives to your husband. In fact, the verb is borrowed, is borrowed. from, from the even previous restated. verse. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. exactly. And we make a new paragraph in the middle of a sentence with right. that. And we miss that he's listing all the ways of being filled with the Spirit, including your family life. And the Spirit is... Is, is the, the overarching you know element there. But anyway, that's part of why a lot of women hate the word submit, because it's been taught to them of you submit and he's in control. And so you give up all your rights and he demand he makes the demands. And that I mean that is a perfect setup for people to be angry. Right? Yeah, because you've de- you've destroyed or you risk yeah. destroying, maybe a better way to say it, yeah. you risk destroying the cooperative relationship right. that we talked about that comes out of Genesis and, and, and thinking through that. So let's, let's, right. let's transition. Here's the exercise I have students do when I teach Ephesians 5. I have them take a yellow sheet of paper. It doesn't have to be yellow, but okay. usually it's yellow legal okay. pad. You know, that makes it official. And you draw a line down the middle, and you put uh, – head and power on one side and you put service on the other. And I say, go through this passage from start to finish <laughs> and everywhere where there are power terms, you know, write them down. Yeah, blank column. And right? <laughs> everywhere where there are service terms, write them down right. and let's see where we are. Right. And I give them some time to do that. And when it's all said and done, inevitably what I have is, at least in most often, is there'll be one term that's on the power side. Okay. It's the term head. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then everything else is on this service column. And, I, mm-hmm. and, and so I ask this question. Tell me what you think is going on when this term sitting here by itself is surrounded by all these terms. Right. Yeah. We've Answer missed the, the question. Boat. We've made an org chart out yeah, of it. Yeah, that's right. And we we've and, and even more than that, not only we've made an org chart out of it, but we have failed to see that what is happening to this term is – it is being reconfigured. It is. It's being completely reconfigured by everything else that's being said over here. So I'm supposed to nurture, care, uh, treat 
the body of this person as if it's my own body, et cetera. Everything, right. it, everything is not about what this person can do for me, but right. about what I can do for this person. And that's what it means and to be ahead. And that's what that's that's what it means mm-hmm. to be ahead. Because the head is connected to a body and Correct. a metaphor. And it's to yeah. and it's to care for the body and right. nurture the body. In fact, to become I'm one. not even yeah. supposed to see the body as a separate from me. Right. Okay. She it's a part you. of who yeah. I am. Exactly. Okay. I, I when I'm in marital counseling, I say, the next time you're fighting with your wife and you're thinking about her as a her, imagine that you're talking to yourself. Yeah. And would that well, change the way you sweet. interact? And so, would you would you would you hear yourself? Right. You know that kind of question. Mm-hmm. And so, so you're trying to to underscore this this emphasis that comes up. Now, I'm curious as to how when you talk about this, how you talk about it, because that's how I talk yeah. about it. Yeah. So uh, I usually I usually look at the metaphor, and usually, let's say, for example, when you ask people, when Jesus is talking about you are the salt of the earth. We make a list of what salt does, right? It's mm-hmm. flavorful, mm-hmm. it's uh, preservative, but when then the next line is, but if the salt has lost its flavor. Mm-hmm. So even though the salt is a preservative, that's not how he's using the metaphor, mm-hmm. right? We do the same thing with head and body. Mm-hmm. He is the head, she's a body. You're interconnected and two shall become one is like all the way through the Bible whenever marriage is mentioned, Right. It's, it's almost like in Genesis, it's like horizontal to become one in the sexual relationship. And then in, in Ephesians, it's to become one with a head and a body, but you're still interconnected. She are you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I, we show a photo of m- my body in an evening gown with my husband's head on it. And students go, ew. And we're like, exactly. It's a creepy creature. Yeah. But that's what Paul's envisioning, yeah, to yeah. become one. And so the goal of marriage is not the proper distribution of gender and function. It's to become one. Mm-hmm. It's unity. It's oneness. So people say, well, then how do you make a decision? And we're like, well, the same way you decide how you're going to go out to dinner. You, we'll go where you'd like to go. No, no, no. We'll go where you. You know that should be our fights. You right? negotiate it out. He, yeah. yeah. How'd you decide to get married? Yeah. One of you didn't like force the question. Right. You, like right. you, right? <laughs> you, you will you marry me, and you will yeah, like it. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, if you think in First Corinthians seven, where a couple is called upon to make a decision, he assumes they can do it by mutual consent. It doesn't have to be a trump card. Mm-hmm. Like the goal is oneness, and we sometimes take couples that are doing a great job of doing that together, of making decisions together, and we say, "Oh, you know, guys, you need to man up. Women, women, you need to like we try woman to down say, exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah." And it's 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 backwards. Like in mm-hmm. Christ, they're doing a great job of being one, and and we get fixated on certain roles that have to happen by men and women and the Paul just isn't saying that at all. And so so the point is is that when you come to this you're actually seeing the actualization of two things. You're seeing the actualization of the way God created men and women in marriage to be to be uniquely united. I mean that is a unique relationship Absolutely. that we're talking about. Right. Uh, but to do so in a way that is mutually concerning, mutually supportive and mutually cooperative. Um, with cl- there are roles defined, but they've all they're also yeah. redefined roles. I mean, yeah. it, 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 he's washing her like that first century. That's a girl's job. Yeah, that's <laughs> right? right. Yeah, so so yeah. you've got that dimension going on, and then you've got this additional element of the modeling in that passage of the way in which Christ and the church are relating right. to each other right. as as the great mystery of the past. In fact, at mm-hmm. one point, Paul is talking and he's talking about that mystery so much that he has to say, "Now I'm talking about Christ." <laughs> In the church, church yeah. everybody, you know, yeah. but it right. but it is also is the mirror, and you don't have a sense of a power struggle in the right. Godhead, you right. know. Every, think, everybody knows where everybody knows what the goal is. Sometimes, though, I think people make a list of okay, if it's Christ in the church, mm-hmm. what does Christ do? He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's God. Mm-hmm. And again, we've we've missed the metaphor, right? He. Because there's a little phrase there that's probably the least quoted part of it is, you know, himself being herself. Let's see, the church of the of the church's head, himself being savior, yes, savior of the body, right. So it's a savior image, right. And because we don't connect the word savior and head, we just ignore that and yeah. keep going. And 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 and, and the emphasis oh. is, and what we do. It's interesting what we do with the word savior when we have this discussion. Oftentimes is we we import all the Christology yes. of the savior into the savior exactly. title. 
But what so, the passage is doing is describing how yeah. Christ saves. He gives, he, he sacrifices, yeah, exactly. etc. So exactly. getting the metaphor right is important right. here. Right. And so th- that automatically opens up a uh, a listening and an engagement within the dynamics of the couple that is to drive the way in which the relationship is working out. And as you said earlier, and I think this is important, uh, it means that the that the husband has to be secure enough, right. okay, yeah. mm-hmm. to be able to be able to say, my point here is not to insist that you be submissive, okay. My point is to care for you enough that this unit works. You're flourishing because yeah. when you're flourishing, we're flourishing, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So when I first started seminary, people would say to him. Doesn't that bother you? She's in seminary. He's like, why should that bother me? My wife is growing in Christ. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, but she might like be the leader. He's like, since when does theology, like learning theology, mean a threat to your marriage? Mm -hmm. That's twisted. Yeah, yeah, right. That's messed up. And that actually is the premise upon which the seminary opened itself up to accept women was to say, there. There, is, there are all kinds of places and spaces in the church where a fully trained woman is actually a good thing to have, and and that 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 work is very very important to the health of the church. That right. the church right. needs functioning mature men and women as teachers to make the church work, and the ability of men and women to work together both inside and outside of marriage as team. Right. In relationship, showing what it is that God has created as He put us together, male and female, on the earth, is an important part of what the church is able to model, and in sometimes model in complete contrast to the way the world uh, right. sorts out that space. Right. Like men and women can work together and model loving one another without it being creepy. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. that's a witness. That's, that's a right. testimony that we can in a be Me brothers. Too world. That's exactly. a very, very important. It's thing healing. To it's like fresh, fresh oxygen in a smoky room. Yeah. That. That wow, you you're so respectful to each other, <laughs> in a good way, right? So it's totally possible. So, Kim, where does that leave you in terms of of questions and, and <laughs> concerns and or things that need to be? Well, I mean, like out? we just said in in comparison to what the world has been saying. So, I guess mm-hmm. maybe one question would then be. Having done study in all of this area, as well as deep theological Mm -hmm. thought, how should we as Christians, especially Christian women, be Mm -hmm. thinking through this overall conversation and culture? Not Mm -hmm. not necessarily just the Me Too movement, but just the whole thing, especially, I mean, they're the... The feminist voice is very loud and very mm-hmm. strong, um, particularly mm-hmm. online and in blogs and that kind of thing. And so, mm-hmm. and and I'm not saying that we shouldn't read and think right. through and right. and be exposed to it, but just how should we think through it? Are there specific things we should keep in yeah, mind? For what would sure you suggest? There are. First of all, there in the same way that there are many Christianities. <laughs> How many Christianities are there, right? There are that many kinds of feminism, Mm -hmm. okay? So when we talk about the feminists, um, like which ones are you talking about? Because some feminists are so pro-women, they think women are better, but that's a tiny margin. Not very many, but those those are the ones we usually point to. Or or they're just anti-men, but most of them aren't. Like most, there are lots of men that consider themselves feminists, and and there are many, many people that just use the word feminism t- uh, in the same. It, it's somebody who's against sexism of any kind. So I, I can agree with that, mm-hmm. right? So you have to even begin with what are you talking about? When I was at the University of Texas at Dallas, work doing PhD studies, I had a radical feminist professor, and I came in with certain assumptions. And the first thing I realized was I'd never prayed for a feminist. I just written them off, right? <laughs> and I grew to love her. And then the more we talked, the more I discovered she thought Jesus was awesome. And she wanted to hear more. And she asked me to bring her a book in a brown paper bag. I kid you not. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so that was a real learning, growing thing for me. And the other thing was, I was really glad I hadn't said in class, I'm not a feminist. Because how those students would have heard me, they would have heard me say, I'm against equal pay, I'm against equal you know, custody in court, if all things considered. Um, how we were even using the word on campus was different from how the world at large was using it. So that's one thing. I think another thing that's really important is to go back to the fact that if we need each other, which we do, then begin by looking at our churches and saying, where are we segregating unnecessarily? For example, when I used to teach in women's Bible study, there were there was no male input at all on the study or on mm-hmm. what we were doing. We weren't coordinating with what the pastor's sermon series was. And so we changed that. Um, looking at missions committees saying, hey, this shouldn't be an all-male committee. <laughs> looking at the hospitality committee, this just shouldn't be an all-female committee. Um, you, you're looking at, you know, who's cooking food in the, in the Bible, right? It's Jesus and Jacob, and you've got um, the, the deacons serving widows. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the women's committee. So that's just a, an acknowledgment that we need each other and looking around and saying, where can we do better job of partnering? And so, the, what, what I think we're saying is, is that there are many more possibilities for how we relate to one another than we tend to give ourselves credit yeah. for. Yeah. And there are ways to think about cooperating with one another that are ways we tend not to think about. And in the midst of that, we we when we when we work together for the same goal, working to develop the same kind of character, encouraging one another in the same kind of direction. It isn't it isn't that there aren't roles. There are, but there but they they aren't as configured in the way right. as some people think, and in the end, they end up being actuated in a much more effective way that I think the Bible has in mind yeah. than uh, if we handle it uh, otherwise. Well, Sandy, I want to thank you for coming in sure. and, and uh, being a part of this, and, and Kim, well done on the yeah, first co-host effort. We're yeah. really pleased to have had you along as well. and. Uh, We appreciate your being a part of the table and hope you will be back again with us soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.